Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, we know that this is a time of celebrating many things. Purim, Queen Esther, she did, she did something very phenomenal and fantastic. We shouldn't say fantastic, supernatural, spiritual. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, she stepped out. But I want to talk to you today about something that uh, some of you may know, but it's kind of a, a, a hidden secret in the Word of God. It, it's something that um, most people don't talk about this time of year, but I want to talk to you about it today, and I think that you're going to understand when we get done that God's Word is true, it's supernatural, there's hidden mysteries that when they're revealed, they prove His Word to be true beyond any scientific calculation that could be made, His Word is true. And so I'm going to give you the little bit of a backstory. I'm not going to keep you a long time because I want you to just get this thought. In the same way we, we, we had a, an offering thought this morning, I'm going to give you a sermon thought. As my mama used to say, I'm going to give you something to thought about. <laughs> okay. Now, there are literally thousands of hidden codes in the Hebrew text of the Bible. Generally speaking, the New Testament was written in Greek, generally. And Old Testament was Hebrew. And so the Hebrew scribes, when they copied, everything is copied so exact. Well, you know, they found in... In Israel, they found a scroll of Isaiah that was like 1,200 years older than any other known copy of Isaiah. And they thought, hmm, in a millennium, I wonder how much has changed. Because they knew that there would be a difference in, in the text. And they found out there wasn't. There wasn't a difference in the text because they use such detail when copying the Old Testament Hebrew text. You know, it's interesting that every time they get to the Lord's name, yud heh vav -Heh, God Almighty's name, and it's written out that way, yud heh vav -Heh, the, the scribe goes and takes a mikvah. He takes a ceremonial bath. And I, I've always thought it was funny, you know, because there's some passages that say, oh, Lord, our Lord, you are Lord. I mean, he gets clean that day. You know, he has to go take a, take a ceremonial bath before he can even write that name down. So it's interesting how the prophecies in the scriptures can be seen and fulfilled when we look back on them, even using these hidden Bible codes. Now, I'm talking about hidden Bible codes in a different way than probably you have heard it taught. So I want to give you one sample that's found in the book of Esther. Now let's take a look at Luke 8, 17. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. We're going to reveal today something. And as I will share in a few moments, Daniel, the prophet, he was told, seal things up, seal this up. And it's not going to be revealed until the end of days. Well, how many of you know we're in the end of days right now? I mean, there's earthquakes, there's eclipses, there's, there's revival, there's things going on that are not like previous days. And there's revelation in the Word of God that's not like the revelation of previous days. First, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the surroundings concerning this prophecy. In the 5th century, King Hazarus, who was king of Persia. Now, Persia, a lot of you don't know where Persia is, but let me just give you this hint. Persia, in 1935, uh, made a petition to change their name to Iran. 
And it wasn't until actually 1979 that the rest of the nations of the world recognized the change of name. So when you hear about Iran today in the news, you're actually hearing about what the Bible calls Persia. But this king, he ruled over 127 provinces, and he gave a banquet to celebrate his greatness. And he invited all of his officials and his servants. And for 180 days, that's almost like a half a year, he displayed his great wealth and everything that he had just to prove to everybody how humble he was as this great man. What a guy. So after that, he made a seven-day feast for all the people in the city. And during this feast, he got intoxicated. Now, for those of you who don't uh, know where our church is, you're watching from around the world, we're in the middle of a resort area, and we understand the phrase intoxicated. Um, so when he was intoxicated, he ordered his queen, Queen Vashti, to come before him wearing her royal crown and reveal her beauty to his guests. Now, according to the Jewish Midrash, it's commonly supposed that what he was commanding his wife to do was to appear in front of these naked, to appear in front of these drunken men naked, nude, and she refused. Now, the scripture doesn't say that, but Jewish history tells us that. So when she refused, this made him furious. And all of his friends came to him, his under rulers, and they said, man, you, you, you got to do something. You, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot let the queen refuse a command of yours, because if she does that, then all the women in the country are going to say, we don't have to obey the men. And we've got rebellion on our hands. So you better get the queen in line. You, get, you, you straighten her out. Probably what you need to do is get rid of her and just get yourself a new queen. So they brought all the young, beautiful virgins that they could find before him. And a series of events happened. You can read this in the Bible. It's, it's a an extremely interesting story. But Esther, who was a, a cousin of Mordecai, and he had found favor with the king because uh, of something he had done in the past. He'd actually done something that saved the king's life. She was crowned queen instead of the previous queen. So... Uh, the king didn't know that she was a Jew. He didn't know this. Now Mordecai had raised her and he walked in favor with the king because as I said before, he had uh, given advice that saved the king's life. Now I'm, I'm giving you a background to where we're going. All right, you, you need to know this story. I know most of you probably know this story by heart, but, but I just want to give it a review here. Now, there was a, an official, his name was Haman, and he was promoted in the king's court by the king, and he sat in a position uh, above all the princes, and it was a position of great authority and great honor, and like the king, he had humility not. He was very arrogant, and he, he wanted everybody to to bow down and honor him. And when the king's servants all bowed down and honored him as, as the king had commanded that they should do, Mordecai wouldn't bow down because he wouldn't give homage to him because he was a Jew. And when he didn't bow down, this made Haman extremely angry. He was filled with wrath and he fixated on something that he wanted done. And here's what he wanted done. He wanted Mordecai dead. And he wanted all the Jews annihilated. He wanted them killed. 
So he went to the king, and he told the king, there's this group of people, and they don't give you honor. In fact, they rebel. They go against you. And so he convinced the king to give him authority to annihilate all the Jews, to kill them all. And uh, both young, old, children, women. And this was to be done, get this, Loretta, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. And when they did this, they could plunder all their possessions. So he would, he would own everything that the Jews owned. So a decree was written that the Jews were to be destroyed, and letters were sent from the king by courier to every province, actually written by Haman. So when Mordecai found out about this, he went to the gate of the city, and he sent message. He sent a message to Esther, who was the queen, and um, told her about the the directive that had been issued to kill all the Jews. And so she sent word back to Mordecai and told him to call for a fast with all the Jews for her. And here's the deal. She knew that she couldn't just go in and talk to the king. Now I know she was the queen and all this. But if the, if the king didn't call for you, you couldn't come in. If you didn't have permission, you couldn't go in. If you walked in to talk to the king and, and he didn't make the right gesture, orders were from the soldiers in the king's court to just kill the person. If you walked in and the king didn't acknowledge you, you were dead. So this was something that she had to kind of deal with. And in Esther 4.16 it says, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, day or night. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She says, okay, I'll, I'll go talk to the king. It's against the law for me to walk in, but I'm going to do it. And if I die, I die. But I'm going to do it. And you know, this is in this story is uh, where we get the phrase, you know, maybe she was just born for such a day as this. You know, it's interesting. There's a lot to this story. I am skipping a lot of stuff. I just want to give you a background of what was happening before I get to the real juicy part here. So uh, Mordecai and all the Jews in the province, they fasted for three days, and a miracle took place. And the result of this miracle from God was this. The Jews were victorious. And Haman had made gallows for Mordecai to be hung on, to be hanged until dead. And what's interesting the gallows that Haman made for Mordecai, he ended up getting hung on those gallows. Wow. Esther 7.10 says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's wrath subsided. The king calmed down a little bit. So the king revoked the letters that were written by Haman that were sent out to kill all the Jews, and instead, he made a decree that the Jews could protect themselves. And anybody came against them, he said, basically, he said, you can go whack them, you know, and, and do what you will. I'm giving you free reign to protect yourselves. Now, there's an interesting conversation. And here's, here's where I'm, I'm headed. There's an interesting conversation that takes place between the queen, Queen Esther, and the king. And it starts in the 12th chapter, the ninth, of, or 12th verse of chapter 9 in, uh, in Esther. And I want to read that to you. Yeah, we have it up on the screen here. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel. 
and the ten sons of Haman, they, they were hung. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Oh, what is your father's request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do, to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. And let Haman's sons be hanged on the gallows. So basically she's saying that his sons, who were already hung, I want them to be hanged tomorrow. And the scripture says here, So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was sent to Shushan. And they hanged Haman's ten sons. They had been, they had been executed. Now, if you take this in the original language and you break it down, and theologians and scholars have battled with this for centuries, basically Queen Esther's request was very strange, to say the least. After all, the sons had already been hung, so why would she say, tomorrow, let's hang them again? Now, in the writings, the rabbis and the midrash, they expound on this word tomorrow. And they say that there is a tomorrow that is now and there's a tomorrow that is later. And basically what they're saying, another way of looking at this, is Esther was prophesying that the, ha the hanging of Haman's ten sons was not something that would be a standalone event, but would be repeated in a future tomorrow now are you following me okay so she was saying the ten sons of Haman were hung but the ten sons of Haman will be hung at a later date now this is interesting so let's go to the Hebrew Bible when you take a look at this scripture in the Hebrew Bible, you're going to find something very interesting indeed. Let's go ahead and put this graphic up now of Esther. Now, when, when you're reading this in English, what you have is just the listing of the ten sons. It says, in Esther 9, 7, 8, and 9, it just lists the ten sons, lists their names, and you just read it. But when you look at it in the Hebrew Bible, on this one page, they do something very different. They list the names of the ten sons on the right column, and on the left column, the word ve'et, is there, which means and, and it's repeated ten times in the left column. Now, what's interesting is you just see the Hebrew text written normal, and then you get to the place where they list the ten sons, and they list them separately on a full page, just like this, and then they go right back to the regular text. Why do they do that? Now, they've done that for centuries, every time a scribe copies the book of Esther, they don't change this. They, they keep it just like this. Why? All right. Well, here's something that's very interesting. You probably can't see it good on the graphic, but if you could look real close on this page, there's three very extremely small Hebrew letters. And the letters are also numbers. And they're Toph, Shin, and Zion. And the scribes always copy it that way. They've got the big letters, huge letters, where they list the ten sons. And then these itty-bitty letters where they have these other three letters. Now, if you convert these to the numeric equivalents, they come to the Jewish year, 5707, 5707. 
On our Gregorian calendar, the calendar we use, that would be the year 1946. It's a year, 1946. Well, let's just ask ourselves, what happened in 1946? Well, in 1946, there were 23 Nazi criminals, and they were tried in what is called the world-famous Nuremberg Trials. Of these 23, 11 of them were sentenced to be hung. They were going to be hanged. Two hours before the 11 were to be hanged, one of them, Hermann Goering, he committed suicide. They can't figure out how in the world he did this, but he committed suicide in his cell. And so only 10 were hung. We now have a, a picture coming up of the, the newspaper from that day. Now, because this was a military tribunal, the normal method of execution was a firing squad or the electric chair. But the judge decided that instead of doing that, they were going to hang these 10 guys. Now, it's kind of interesting that everything happened exactly as Queen Esther had prophesied when her request was tomorrow, and it's even encoded in there, 1946, there will be 10 sons of Haman hanged the first ten sons were in cahoots to destroy the Jews. The next ten sons, the ten Nazis, were trying to destroy the Jewish people. Now it's interesting to note that the ten sons of Haman in the book of Esther were descendants of Amalek. And many historians say that all ten of these Nazis were also descendants of Amalek. Now, Adolf Hitler, he was, uh, well, he knew that the Jews were connected with some type of supernatural power, and it's obvious because of his fear of them. He declared that every person, any person who was found with a copy of the book of Esther, the Jewish soldiers were told, you can execute them immediately. Why? Why? Why was he so afraid? See, now, for centuries, the Jews have celebrated victory, the victory of Mordecai and Esther, on a holiday called Purim. And because of this, the Nazis, on that Jewish holiday, many times would execute people. Hmm. For example, in 1942, Ten Jews were hung in Zedeska Wola, wherever that is, for the purpose of avenging Haman. In 1943, the Nazis shot ten Jews from the ghetto to avenge Haman. Hitler was fearful of the Jews. The same year, they executed over a hundred doctors and their families. It's interesting that on January the 30th, 1944, Hitler made a speech, and he said, if for any reason the Nazis are defeated in this war, the Jews would celebrate a second Purim. Can you believe that? It's amazing. Now, the New York Herald Tribune in October 16, 1946, reported that Julius Steicher, who was one of the ten who were hung, when he went to the gallows with burning hatred in his eyes, he looked down at the witnesses and shouted his last words as he was hanged, and he said, Purim, 1946! The prophecy of Esther was fulfilled. Wow, isn't that amazing? Although like 2,400 years had gone by, the prophecy took place. 
And this is what we can't forget today. And this is what I want to remind you. Daniel said in chapter 12, verse 4, but you, or it says to Daniel, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the end of time, till the time of the end. Wow. Are we in the time of the end right now? Prophecy is being fulfilled. It says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. You know, and, and I've said this many, many times, and, but I'm going to say it one more time. We live in a generation where knowledge has increased like no other generation. From the time Adam was kicked out of the garden until now, 6,000 years, man traveled on the fastest animal he could find. And in the last 100 years, we've traveled to the moon. My grandmother told me that she saw her first car when she was 13 years old. And before she died, she watched on a little box in her room. She watched people land on the moon. Knowledge has increased. The science fiction of just 20 years ago is a reality today. In the 1960s, a woman was ridiculed because she said, someday you'll be able to talk on a phone with no cord. Hello? Hmm. Well, we know this, 1 Thessalonians 5.20 says, do not despise prophecies. Now, you're going to hear a lot of prophecies in these end of days. And there's a lot of prophets and a lot of losses. Let's put it this way. There's a lot of prophets and there's a lot of proclaimed prophets. And you are to judge prophecy based upon it paralleling the Word of God and whether or not it seems right to the Holy Spirit who is in you. You know, the Bible tells us, don't believe everything you hear. Some things can sound really, really good, and they're really, really fake. Now, there's a lot of prophecies coming out right now that are real. And we need, we need to take note. There's revivals happening that are real. There's things happening in the, in the sky that are real. And we need to judge that according to Bible prophecy. Hmm. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that there are gifts of the Holy Spirit. It says, now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And then it goes on, but when it lists the gifts... One of the things it lists in verse 10 is the gift of prophecy. So, with prophecy, there's a prophet. We can prophesy. You can prophesy and not be a prophet, but we need to understand this. There are prophets. And you need to watch who you follow. You know, I know this, this may sound like a joke, and I don't mean it offensive or anything, but... but uh, I've lived through five or six end of the worlds in, in my life. I remember when people were so afraid of Y2K, you know. And I taught a sermon that Sunday called Why To Worry, you know. But we don't want to be in a situation where we think we've heard everything so much that we disbelieve everything that comes along. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says this, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in which, okay, look, I'm just going to tell you this. Peter said, you've always heard that this is happening. And there are people out there who are saying, I've heard this before. And I've heard this, they've been prophesying this forever. But just because it's been prophesied forever, do not discount that we are the generation that's going to see these things take place. And I encourage you to read these scriptures. You know, in 2 Chronicles 20.20, 20, it says, believe the prophets and prosper. Well, the implication there is that if you don't believe the prophets, you won't prosper. And that prosperity is not just talking about money. That's talking about your livelihood, your existence. And I proclaim this to you today, 
This is the generation that will see these things come to pass. And we need to be awake and not slumber. For we're going to be, we are close to the time when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. It's going to sound. And as you heard me say before, that trumpet's going to toot, we're going to shoot, we're going to be out of here. And there's going to be a great tribulation on this earth, but God has not appointed us to the wrath to come. And there's going to be wonders in the sky. There will be wonders in the sky. You're going to hear of these things. And they are signs. But the greatest wonder in the sky that's going to take place is when our Lord appears. And we're going to see prophecy revealed like never before. The book's been sealed up until the end of days. And we are in the end of days. And I will tell you this. You will read scriptures that you've read all your life. And as you're reading them now, you're going to say, wait a minute, I'm seeing something I've never seen. So don't take even the casual word of God, and I say that the word of God that you consider common, you've read it so much, you've read the 91st Psalm so many times, you can just quote it in your sleep, but sit down and meditate on it, and God will reveal Every passage will have a greater revelation. Wow. God is good. Stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you the glory. I give you the praise. And I thank you, Father, for the revelation that's in your word. Hmm. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, just as a sidebar, uh, Phil, where are you? Uh, Phil had something you wanted to share here for a moment, a scripture. But as a sidebar, understand this. What was revealed in the revelation in the book of Esther could not be revealed until after it happened. And looking back, now you can see why those letters were large and why that date was encoded in there. And, and it confirms the Word of God. But before it happens, there was no way to know that. And so I believe what we're going to see is we're going to see things happen in these end of days. And then as we see them happen, we're going to say, oh my gosh, that's what the Scripture was talking about. And it's going to open up things that have never been opened before. <laughs> 